one sat alone beside the highway begging his eyes were blind the light he could not see he clutched his old rags and shivered in the shadows then jesus came and bade his darkness flee it's time to open the word once again with evangelist lester roloff on the family altar program Glory for all is changed when jesus comes to stay the 14th chapter of the book of Romans and verse 23 will introduce our message. And he that doubteth is damned if he eat, because he eateth not of faith. For whatsoever is not of faith is sin. The last phrase of that verse. For whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Reckon how many folks had to throw into sin all of a sudden. You know, sometimes people seek to commend Brother Olaf or the enterprises for living by faith. Well, dear friends, it's about the only way I know for a Christian to live. I mean, not, not a matter of Brother Olaf, not a matter of Brother anybody else. It's just a matter of whether you want to live in sin or out of sin. I don't want my ministry to be characterized by sin. And if I do not live by faith, then I'm living in sin. I want the message tonight. I've, I've planned nothing. I've, uh, I've arranged nothing. I just felt like I want to speak tonight on the subject of faith. And then I want to speak in the morning on what makes life worth living. And then I want to speak on prayer at 11 o'clock. And then tomorrow night, I'd like to speak on that horrible monster called sin or the devil. I want to share with you some things tomorrow night that uh, 20 years ago, nobody would have ever dreamed of would be in our nation. Mr. Art Linkletter. who wrote a rather lengthy message as a result of the death of his darling Diane, just a young girl. Dope killed her. And he and his wife felt that they had a Christian obligation to expose dope and the death-dealing blows of the dope rackets of this country. In that article, he says exactly what I've been saying for 20 years. We're living in a dope culture. And it's become accepted. And I'm going to give you two of the outstanding practices that will immediately precede the coming of Jesus tomorrow night. The mind's got to get gone. The people will be insane when he comes. Minds will be failing, the Bible says, for fear. Most everybody lives by fear, not by faith. Now, the opposite of faith is fear. But tonight, I want to bring a message on the subject of faith. Now, let me get my text again. The Bible says, for whatsoever is not of faith is sin. What do you suppose the daddy sinned? I mean, look like little sins ought to have a father. We talk about little sin, we say that's a little sin. I mean, I've got some little sins in my life. I know, but what's the daddy of them? Who's the big daddy? I wonder if we're coming tonight to the man. What, what is the one thing that keeps people from going to heaven and send a man straight to hell? What is it? Is it cigarette smoking? No, sir. Is it lying? No, sir. Is it dope addiction? No, sir. Uh, is it uh, impure living? No, sir. There's only one thing. I said there's only one thing that'll take a man to hell. You know what it is? It's the opposite of faith. It's 
unfaith or unbelief. That's all. Now then, what will take a man all the way to heaven? Faith in Jesus Christ. What is the one prerequisite to being saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. What is belief? That's faith. Now, they never have invented a word. I wouldn't care if they did. I think it'd be nice. Uh, in other words, faith on the Lord Jesus, or believe on the Lord. Faith. Now, let's go to the book of uh, Hebrews. Book of Hebrews. And you know it's the 11th chapter, don't you? There comes a time in my life, and I'm, it never comes too often to suit me when the Lord reminds me of my lifeline and said, Son, I want you to graze in this pasture a while. I'd like for you to renew your faith. I'd like to show you where you got it. And I'm going to talk about where you get your faith and what your faith will do. And we've already mentioned if you're not willing to live by faith, you're living in sin. If you're living in sin, you're living a miserable life. You're not living, you're existing. I'd like to be able to teach all of our workers to live completely by faith. I'd like to be able to teach all the girls and boys and people in the home, you're going to have to learn to live by faith. There's no problem for an alcoholic to give up liquor if he learns to live by faith. You know what living by faith is? It's just living on the Lord. It's just living his life. Paul said for me to live is what? Christ. For me to live is Christ. Paul said, I know that in me that is in my flesh that dwells no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. Then he said, I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. Now, we a lot of times say I can do all things and do nothing. If we can do all things, then it looks to me like we have a scriptural, spiritual obligation to do it. I like the verse that said, let everything be done. And I know a lot of people emphasize the indecency and in order. main thing I want to do is just do something. not worried about I, a lot of people say, well, I think we ought to be, uh, do it in decency and in order. They talk a lot about that. Well, brother, if God does it, it'll be decent and it'll be in order. I mean, sometimes we, we act like we, and I say it very reverently now in the presence of the Lord, he never does anything wrong. And some of you girls, you think that you're just having an awful time coming under. Coming under what? Are you coming under love and grace and under heaven and on your way and ought to be enjoying the trip. Talk about giving up. You didn't give anything. Think about it. I don't care. Looks to me like anybody want to give up dope. Look like anybody want to give up immorality. I mean, that's what the world's doing. I tell you, if you look around and whatever you see the world doing, run from. You've heard me say that before. Don't do anything you see the world doing. Really, the world has always been wrong. Whatever you see the majority of the people doing, you do just the opposite. You'll be right just about every time. Why? Because the Bible says that broad is that old way. And that old gate is a big wide gate. And he said, uh, many there be that go in thereat. I mean, many there be. See, a lot of people. And not because God wants it that way, but that's the way people are. People are born with a sinful nature, and it gets worse until they get born again. And uh, so in the 11th chapter of the book of Hebrews, and I'm going to back up just far enough into the 10th chapter to begin uh, with uh, verse 32. But call to remembrance the former days in which after ye were illuminated, after ye were illuminated. Now, I reckon what that means. Illuminate. It means to lighten up, doesn't it? If you, if, if you illuminate the room, it means that you... Uh, last night, uh, we uh, took about nine in a very foolish crew and decided we'd go to Nine Mile Hole. See, the Nine Mile Hole is the traditional spot of the intercoastal. I've watched that thing for years. You see, I'm going to preach a sermon one of these days on Nine Mile Hole. Most people live in Nine Mile Hole. You know why? They're cut off. They're just cut off. To me, it's a tragic thing. That, and I fly over it, and I see the fish, tons and tons and tons of fish, big red fish that long, beautiful fish. Now, they go in with the tide. They go in with a high tide. Everything's fine. There's a lot of grass back there. Oh, there's a lot of bait back there. Man, I'm telling you, we walked through that grass last night for hours and hours, and uh, the fish are in there. 
and, and they, they're just like people. They never think about the future. And all of a sudden, them old fish begin to look around and say, hmm. Said, this is getting awful shallow. After a while, one of them said, I'm having a hard time breathing. All of them, they begin to panic then, see. Yeah, that's right. They're cut off. You see, verse, uh, the, the tide rolls in in a hurry, see. Oh, it just come. You can go in there in a boat. But come about June and July, all of a sudden, the tide rolls out, and then there's two miles of nothing but sand and mud. And it leaves them in nine miles of water. We call it the nine-mile hole. And the fish said, listen, boy, there's enough water here forever. No need worrying. But you let that old July and that June and August sun begin to burn down. Now, last year, when Celia came, when Celia came through, uh, they were just ready to die. And old Celia rolled a tide in and rescued those fish. But... Just like people, as far as I know, some of them are still in there. I mean, they just didn't get out. They said, man, <laughs> just one of those things. I we're, see there? It's gonna, but this time, they're done for. I'll guarantee you, there'll be tons and tons of dead fish. And uh, they're in there now, and uh, they're living. But there's going to be two things that's going to get them. One thing is the water's going to play out. And second, the oxygen is going to play out. And they're going to be unable to breathe. And the fish are beginning to slow down. And after a while, and listen, the birds have already moved in. The old birds are standing there waiting, watching in the shallow water, just that deep now, just that deep. And the birds are standing with their long legs and saying, we, we're waiting, we'll peck your eyeballs out. That's what they do. It's the first thing they do is peck the eyeballs out of the fish. And then next, you'll see the old coyotes from the ranches begin to come across and go out across that mud, and they'll begin to eat dead fish. And those fish are going to be bait for the coyotes, and their eyes will be plucked out by the birds. Why? Because they went in with the tide, but they didn't get out. And that's the way a lot of people, they're caught on a low tide. And that's exactly the way America's being caught right now. America came in on a full tide, and directly she began to vote liquor in and saloons back. And now contemplating homosexuality and contemplating every sin and legalizing of dope, we're, we're, we're riding a low tide, and it looks to me like, without me uh, being overly uh, dismal in my outlook, it looks to me like we've been cut off. And unless there comes a mighty storm and a seal of revival, then there'll not be enough tide for us to live. You wait and see. You girls, you think you've got forever to live. We may be winding this thing up right now. Any minute now. I said any minute. We've already been cut off. The whole world, look like, is cut off. Oh, how sad and sinful has our nation become. Now then, go with me. Call a remembrance. The former days in which, after you were illuminated, you endured a great fight of afflictions. You were illuminated. I started to tell you about the illumination. You know how we found our way back this morning at 1 o'clock in the morning after we'd uh, gotten some fish and so forth and had a big time with these nine boys? We carried, we carried two ice boxes. We carried a number three tub full. We carried all the gigs and all the rods and the reels, and we carried a 16-foot boat two miles. <laughs> and yet, this is sweet. We was going across that old that old muddy ground, and every once in a while we hit some pretty good sand, we'd pull the boat and lift the boat and carry the boat, and the boys were going along there, nine of them. Some of them sent us to five years in the pen, and old John and others singing, Great is the Lord. And you could hear them all over that prairie. We'd have them big time. I spoke last night. We was out there, and of course, when you get out in the middle of the water, ain't no place to sit down except in the water. And that little old 16-foot aluminum boat, aluminum boat, all nine of us got in and sat down in the thing for the evening service. <laughs> we had evening vespers in Nine Mile Hole. <laughs> and, of course, uh, when we all sat down in it, it just went right down to the ground. That was one of the blessings of a low tide, is it didn't go on. But I was just thinking, there they were. There was old, there was old Irvin. Two years ago, I met him in the jailhouse. And last night, I heard old Irvin been a drunkard, living in sin, 
and uh, been in the jails, and, and uh, I just talked to his precious wife while ago uh, up in Kansas, and I heard him last night, and we were walking along carrying the boat, and I heard old Irvin say, well, praise the Lord. He hadn't said that many times in his whole life, if any. That probably was the first time he'd ever said, well, praise the Lord. Of course, I think he saw the light of the boat when we was coming in, see. We put a lantern on the boat where we left the boat way across miles, and we could see that one thing that guided us, which we'd have never found, was just one little light. It, after you were illuminated, you endured. You know why people are not enduring today? They've never been illuminated. You know why people can't take it today? They've never been illuminated. They don't have enough light. You know why people hit the ditch today? They haven't got the illumination. They just have not been illuminated. I came off the ground last night at 2 o'clock uh, in the morning, and old Craig, he, Craig Weatherford, he decided he wanted to go to Nine Mile Hole. <laughs> I said, son, you've asked for a hard thing. But bless his heart, he, he's got uh, some East Texas stamina, and he made it all right. But I tell you, the time I got off the ground on that plane, I looked over at old Craig. <laughs> he was gone. He's sound asleep. <laughs> he slept all the way back. But we, you know the way we took off? We were illuminated, turned on those landing lights, and you could see. And brother, you better see. I tell you, I went out there the morning and about daylight, and I landed between two herds of cows. We nearly had chopped steak for breakfast. <laughs> illuminate. Illu have you ever been illuminated? Do you know what it is to be illuminated? I mean, have you got the light? That, now, the light always comes on the inside, but it always shines out. You never get illuminated on the inside, but what you'll get to shine on the outside. You know what illuminated Moses? The Word of God. You know the only man that ever wore a veil and wasn't a sissy? It is Moses. I wouldn't mind men having to wear veils if we get that illuminated now. I wouldn't mind putting on a veil because he, he came, you know where he was? He was having a summit conference up at, up at um, uh, Sinai. And that's where the Word of God came. The first time the Word of God ever came, it lighted a man's face so strong till they said, Whoo! We can't stand to look at you. Put a veil on. Blinding the people. That's the word of God for you. I'm talking about illumination. I'm talking, there'll be no regeneration without illumination. There'll be no sanctification without illumination. I'm preaching the truth tonight, and you know it. We've got to get lit up. Huh. And it's strange how the devil, how the devil uh, says things, and he, how he changes light. Somebody said, talk about a man. I said, boy, he was lit. Lit? You mean he was drunk? He wasn't lit. He's dark. I mean, he blacked out. But you see, the devil, see, the devil likes to make you think that when you're living in sin, boy, you're living it up. No, you're not. You're dying it up. And they like to say when the man's drunk and staggering and stumbling and slobbering, they said, boy, he really got lit up. I mean, he was lit. He was lit, lit. No, he wasn't either. Let me tell you something. You're never illuminated until God's Word illuminates you. I got a friend that uh, works the approach control over at Canesville, and I like to talk with him. I go down there and sometimes come out at night, uh, two or three times this last week, and I go down there maybe late in the afternoon or maybe real early in the morning and uh, take provisions and bring boys and take people and so forth. And so uh, I said to the man, where's my friend? Oh, they said he went to... Uh, this big uh, celebration or something, you know. And said, boy, he called me and said he was just about, you know, three sheets in the wind. And he thought I was going to like it. I said, boy, let me get a hold of him. I'm going to work him over. Oh, I said, he said, who are you? I said, well, just a preacher. But see, he thought he was having a big time. But he was getting, he was ineb inebriated. That's not getting lit. That's not illuminated. I mean, that, that blacks your brain out. And that, that cuts you off from a, a, a good existence and a real life. So after you were illuminated, what did you do? Well, he said you endured. You endured. What did you endure? A great fight of afflictions. Brother, sister, you girls might as well learn while you're young, while you're here in the home, you men and women out in the, that are visitors. Just as soon as you get illuminated, brother, you've entered the fight. Darkness is coming after you. Now, darkness never fights darkness. Never. You never, if you're walking in the dark, living in the dark, you won't ever have any trouble with the dark. You just kind of stumble on through it. But let me tell you something. When you get illuminated, then there, there's that constant conflict 
that's going to start right then between light and dark. What's the opposite of darkness? Light. And so there's that constant, and let me say something else. Darkness is no match for light. We had, we had three miles to walk last night, and there's one thing we agreed that we were going to guard as we called all of our signals because there wouldn't be no coming back. We had to get done what we was going to get done when we got over there, and we, we had to have some matches to light those lanterns by which we'd flounder. And so Mike said, Brother Olaf, you put some in the dry pocket. You put some in your pocket. I'll put some in mine. We've got to be illuminated when we get over there. Amen? We've got to get those lanterns going. Without a lantern? Why, we couldn't see anything. Now then, Christians, there's only one thing that'll ever get your light to burn in, and that's getting connected with the oil barrel. It takes oil to make the light burn, doesn't it? You remember the five foolish virgins and the five wise virgins? You remember the difference between the two? Oil. Oil. They had a, they had a light. I mean, they had a, they had a lamp. They had a globe. They had a wick. Uh, they had, uh, I guess, all the, they had everything except oil. They were looking for the Lord to come. They got ready. I mean, they said, he'll be coming. We'll get out here and wait for him. Throw him to sleep. When they woke up, the bridegroom cometh. And suddenly that announcement came. They didn't have time to go get any oil. And they couldn't borrow any. You can't borrow oil. You've got to go to the oil well to get it. I mean, you just don't borrow oil from a person. See, you don't borrow my spirit. You, I don't borrow your spirit. And, oh, I, I listened to the messages this week. I guess one of the hardest things I've ever done was to listen to my messages instead of being on live. But I was determined to do it. And that's the biggest accomplishment I've ever made in the way of broadcasting. I listened to just about every one of them. And I, I hollered amen a bunch of times. <laughs> every once in a while, I holler old me. But I believe what I preach. I believe, and I, got, I enjoy it, especially uh, digging ditches, digging ditches, make this valley full of ditches. And I think that bunch would have joined the welfare and sat down and said, we're not going to dig ditches. I think they'd starve right there, and that's what they ought to have done. Amen? We've got the laziest generation of white folks, to say nothing about anybody else, that ever lived on the face of this earth. And it's an immoral thing. It's a dishonest thing. Credible able to work that doesn't work. And the boys are beginning, Brother Strateski, to learn to work. They've never been taught to work. They're beginning now. I mean, when you say get up, and, and you, oh, last night I remember at uh, midnight, one o'clock in the morning, Brother Mike said, uh, all right, wake some of the boys up and tell them to go signing. And here they came, right out, you know, ready to go. You got to teach. You know, you have to train. The Bible said train up a child. They come untrained, completely untrained. A child knows nothing when it's born. You've got to teach it everything. And I tell you what, it will learn accidentally and automatically everything that's wrong, but you've got to teach it that which is right. The flesh is so depraved and it's so uh, delinquent when it's born. You've got to treat, teach and train everything that it's supposed to know that's good. And mothers and dads, that's where we come in. That's why we need uh, to do the teaching. But he said, after that you were illuminated, you endured a great fight. A great fight. Look at that. A great fight of affliction. I believe I'm going to have a fight or I'll have a great fight, hadn't you? I mean, these little old piddling fights. I mean, I, if I'm going to have a fight, I'd like to have a good one. And then I can know, you know, when it's over, that at least uh, if I got a victory, I got a good one. I mean, if it's a little fight and you win, you got a little victory. If it's a big fight <laughs> and you get the victory, you got a big victory. And uh, we must not be afraid of the fight. Now, verse 33, partly, whilst you were made a gazing stock, both by reproaches and afflictions, and partly while you became companions of them that were so used. And notice, he said, y'all just became my partners, you see. While you were made a gazing stock. That doesn't sound too good, does it? A gazing stock. People gazed at them. I mean, they gazed at uh, Brother Noah, too, didn't they? I mean, they gazed at that ark. But I tell you one thing, gazing and getting in is two different things. It's not enough to gaze at Jesus. You better trust him. Not enough to gaze at a uh, good thing. Get in. For you had compassion of me in my bonds and took what? Joyfully 
the spoiling of your goods. Did you know that's the battle you're fighting right here in the home? You just die when you give up your silly, rotten, stinking goods. Really, I don't know why we call them goods. All, you get, all we've asked you to give up is your bads. That's right. And anybody ought to joyfully give up their bads. One of them is dope of some sort, and that's a bad. Now, that's bad. I mean, that'll ruin your mind, that'll ruin your body, that'll make you a slave to every old uh, sinner that comes by. And, and just think, uh, and cigarettes, liquor, and then immorality are just the flesh, and that's it. Now then, let me ask you this. If there's nothing good about the flesh, then what good thing are you giving up in order to be what you ought to be for Jesus? And so you see... Some of you refuse to open your eyes. You, you're being just hard to get along with because you just are making up your mind, I'm going back to the world. I'm not going to have anything to do with God. I'm not going to receive Jesus Christ. You just watch and see. Oh, I tell you, I long to see you. Just hurriedly come to Christ because he said, take joy for the spoiling of your goods, knowing in yourselves that you have in heaven a better. That's the theme of Hebrews right there, better. Better and enduring substance. And, you know, the ministry of the church and all the other, it always makes everybody better or bitter. That's right. But, oh, it's such a wonderful day when it gets better. When you decide, I believe I'll go God's way. Cast not away, therefore, your confidence, which hath great con uh, recompense or reward, for you have need of patience, that after you've done the will of God, you might receive the promise for yet a little while, and he that shall come will come and will not tarry. Now here's our theme verse for the entire ministry. Now the just shall live by faith. But if any man draw back or if any little girl draws back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him or her. But we're not of them who draw back under perdition. That's where you're drawing back to. It's where you're going back to. Perdition, that means destruction. But of them that believe to the saving of the soul. Now, just forget about chapter 11. Let's just run it together. Verse 40, if you'd like to put it like that. Next verse, please. Now faith is, that's good. What is it? The substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, Read it again. When is faith now? Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtain a good report. We sing the little song, we're going to shake hands with the elders. But you know how they got up there, don't you? Through faith. Now we're all in school down here. And we're going to all have to face report cards. Examination day is coming up. Now, all of you might as well face it. Every last one of you, you're in school right now. And uh, you're going to have to have a final exam one of these days. And we're getting ready now for the final exam. And we're going to either flunk or we're going to pass. Now, you'd say, well, I'd sure like to pass. Well, I've got good news for you. The only way you can pass is by faith. Because the Bible said by faith they obtained a good report card. You'd say, well, I don't want to live by faith. Then you don't want a good report, and you won't be accepted in the beloved. You'll find no place in the Bible, no place in the Bible that, that will say to you that you can go to heaven by works or by church membership or by any earthly connection. There's not any way at all. Even Abraham believed God. And it was counted to him for righteousness. And they carried that right over to the book of Romans chapter 4 and said, what saith the scripture? What saith the scripture? Why, he said, uh, uh, Abraham, concerning Abraham. And then he repeats it. And they said, if Abraham had gained his entrance by works, then he said, it would not be of faith. And so you don't work for salvation. You work after you get salvation. You accept the gift of salvation, and then you go to work. Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him for righteousness. But to him that worketh not, 
it's counted to him. His faith is counted for righteousness. And so you see, you do not work in order to get in. You work after you get in because God does the working. And that's the plan of salvation, and that's God's grace. Now, uh, here he says, they believed, and they got a good report card. Through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not, were not made of things which do appear. You know one of the things that's wrecked our young people? It's our public school system. They've denied the Bible. They've denied a living Lord. They've denied the virgin birth. They've denied the creation story as it's recorded in the book of Genesis. They've turned our kids out a bunch of infidels or at least confused, and they have no faith in anything or anybody anymore. I'll tell you something else that I said somewhere maybe this week, and that is that the earthly father is to be a type of the heavenly father. Now, our heavenly father is stern, but he's loving and kind and patient and powerful. Now, the earthly father, but wait a minute. Suppose the earthly father turns out to be a brute or a drunkard or a doof addict or he becomes untrue to his family. You know what happens? The children immediately lose their faith in the heavenly father because they said, well, if my earthly father that I see every day is like that, my heavenly father may turn out to be just like that himself. And so the earthly father is to be a demonstration every day of the faithfulness of the heavenly father. The home ought to be, I mean the wife, the husband, the children, it ought to be a little type of heaven down here and what we're going to have a lot of when we get up yonder. Man, see, without God is the most depraved thing, the meanest thing. He's the only thing that's ever carried on war ever since he's been on the face of the earth. Ever, he, he can't get along nation against nation, war and rumors of wars. The Bible said it would be like that when Jesus comes again. Well, he said, through faith we understand. By faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead, yet speaketh. I'm going to close there, I think, in a little bit, but I want to ask where faith comes from, and I want to show you one thing about faith. Nearly about everybody dreads to die. I mean, just about everybody wants to live. I talked to an old friend the other day, and he's around between 85 and 90, and he said, I, I'm really trying to make it to 100. And he said, I believe well. He said, I, one of my main desires is to make it to 100. I want to live 100. You watch. If he lives 100 years old, he's going to say, I tell you, I wish I could make it 125. I mean, just about everybody hates to wind this thing up down here. I mean, we just don't look on life as continuing, see? I mean, when a fellow gets to the place, you know, where he is uh, not active and he, and, and, and the Lord says, now, uh, I tell you, I got a new body for you. He said, no, <laughs> let me keep this old one. Yeah, but I got a brand new one for you. No pains, no aches, and no ills, and and no, he said, I, I like this old body. I've been living in so long, and, and I know that my headlights are getting dim, and, you know, and I'm kind of running on the rim, and, and I, I, I don't feel well, and I've slowed up, and I can't, but I believe I stay in this one. I, I, and, and so finally, the Lord just has to come down and shake him real good and said, come on out of there. I'm taking you home whether you want to go home. Now, don't you know just about 60 seconds after that, he said, I, I wish you'd come to me sooner. You know, I'm so glad to get this brand new body uh, that I'm going to have. But you see, man likes to stay down here. He likes to stay down here. And a lot of times, a lot of times the reason he wants to stay here because here is all he knows. He knows nothing about hereafter. I mean, he has no hope of living in heaven, and the world has said there's no heaven, there's no hell. I've never in my life uh, seen so many uh, young people as, as they are making fun of heaven and hell now, see. You can't imagine what you precious girls are, and, and the people that come out here are being exposed to that I didn't get exposed to when I was coming out. Nobody ever told me I could live by faith. That's all we've preached to you. And you've seen a demonstration of it. A demonstration of it. We've just gone through another month and every bill was paid to the tune of $3,000 every 24 hours. Don't you tell me that's not a miracle. That's $101,000 that came in again in one month. You'd say, well, I don't know why. Well, I'll tell you why. 
God loves a bunch of little old girls like y'all, and he loves the work of the Lord, and he loves people in trouble. All that bunch of little old hoodlums down in the coastal tonight that'll be praying. We got out there in the middle of Nine Mile Hole last night, and I brought a message on uh, Peter when he said, I, I, I go fishing. And they said, well, you're not going by yourself. We're going along. And it just kind of reminded me of all of us. Everybody wanted to go to Nine Mile Hole last night because everybody was glad to get back. I mean, they just were so relieved when we walked up on that boat and climbed in and sat down and cut a watermelon. <laughs> I tell you, we, we had a great time. But, you know, when they went fishing, and when you go fishing, everybody was a singing and a talking and a jabbering and a wires cracking and the pulling and the lifting and the carrying on. But about 1 or 2 o'clock in the morning, things had quietened down a good deal. And Jesus came upon him and stood on the shore of their failure. Didn't have one. They, they, didn't even have a, they didn't have a mullet. They didn't have nothing. They didn't catch one thing. And Simon Peter was a commercial fisherman. And he knew exactly where to fish, why he'd been in that hole of water so many times. And he'd fished at night and knew night was the best time to fish. And he was out there and they fished and toiled and sang and didn't catch one thing. And Jesus came and you know what he asked them? Children? I guess he's acting like children maybe. Because God already put the call on him. He said, children? He still owned them. He still, he still said, y'all are my children. Whether you're disobedient, whether you catch anything, or whether you're good fishermen or not, you're still my children. Children? Have you any meat? You know what they said? No. He didn't say, no, sir. Or, no, we're having a hard time. They didn't say one thing except N-O. No, no. said no. I tell you, you don't talk too much after a bad night of fishing. I mean, you just kind of run down. And uh, you know what he did for them? He fed them. He said, well, I've caught some. Jesus is the master fisherman. He's the, he's the king of all fishermen. And when they came in, you know what they found? They found fish, fresh fish on some coals of fire, baked fish. That's right. And he fed them. And he fed them before he ever asked them how much they loved him. You know, you get a fellow real hungry, he'd rather eat than talk about love. I mean, rather, he asking, answering Jesus. But he, Jesus did the thing that was normal and natural. He knew they were hungry, and he said, I'm going to feed them. They're my children. And I'm not going to sit around saying, well, do you love me more than these? He said, I'll feed them first, and then I'll ask them that. And he did. Jesus does everything just right. Did you know that? Everything. He doesn't forget the physical needs of these old silly bodies of ours. He knows what we need, and he'll supply all of our needs, because he was tempted in all points, like as we are, yet without sin. The great supreme sacrificial life of faith was Jesus Christ. He left heaven by faith. He went to the cross by faith. He went in the grave by faith, came up by faith. He took off by faith. He's coming back by faith, and I'm going to go meet him by faith. Amen? <laughs> yeah, I'm having a good time. Brother, sister, there's just one way to live, and that's by faith. And if you're not going to live by faith, now just forget living a great Christian life. You can't. You've got to live in sin. That's the reason I don't want a lot of worldly trappings. I don't want a lot of harness, see? I don't want a lot of baggage. I don't want a lot of junk hanging on me. Paul said, now if you're going to run a race, lay aside every weight and be sinned that does so easily beset you. And he said, be not entangled again with the things of this world if you're going to fight a good warfare. So you've got to get unencumbered. I mean, you've got to get dressed for the race. I mean, you can't have a bunch of worldly junk hanging in every pocket, see. I think about these, you know, you read in the paper about sometimes or somebody announced on the newscast, purse snatcher. Oh, yeah, I said, somebody, I, some lady told me this week, said, a, a man snatched my purse and ran off with it. Snatched my purse, just ran off with it. Well, if you really chase that rabbit to the hole, there's a lot of purse snatchers. Did you know that? The liquor store snatching a lot of people's billfolds right off of their hip. The drug store sure doing a lot of purse snatching. One of our doctors just killed himself after the federal boys got after him and said $60,000 of Medicare money. He couldn't face it. He <coughs> took the pistol and ate up a bullet right down his mouth. I tell you, I believe it's better to be honest. It, you see, a man that's not a Christian can't be honest. Now, that's going to irk some people, but that's the truth. You cannot be honest until you come to Christ because you're living a life of ingratitude 
and you're living on God and won't recognize it. And God supplies and holds everything together. And in him you live and move and have you been. And yet you won't recognize God's ownership and your stewardship. You're being dishonest. You're God's property by creation, by sustenance, and by regeneration. And if you don't recognize it, you're not honest with God. Nobody. I believe that the main, the main root of honesty is recognizing that God owns everything. I'm living off of him. If I could put it loving, I'm a sharecropper. I'm a renter. He lets me have his land. I don't own a lick of it. And yet one of these days I'm going to own all of it or be a joint heir with Jesus Christ. Think about that. That's the reason I can't get uh, wound up about buying anything down here. Why buy it when God's going to give it to me? I mean, that's good business. You know that? Oh, listen, use what you have now and then live off of God. Let him know you trust him. You're not trusting the world to take care of you. By faith, Abel offered unto God and he being dead. Now then, I want to give you some things about faith and close the message. Faith will make you immortal. The faith's the only thing that'll make you immortal. Faith will keep the undertaker from getting you. Oh, you'd say, really? That's right. And he being dead, yet speaketh. Why, well, my, listen, Abel, Abel. Why, well, he beat everybody home from the cemetery. He was a talking and a walking. I mean, the Bible said, he by it being dead, yet speaketh, or still speaketh. He's speaking today. Faith, by, by faith he offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice. Not a more excellent Abel, but a more excellent sacrifice. That was the blood sacrifice. That's the most excellent sacrifice you'll ever make, is the blood sacrifice. That's Jesus. That's the most excellent. That's the, and that'll get you into the excellent salvation and get you into the excellent way and it'll give you that excellent love that he talks about in 1 Corinthians uh, uh, chapter 12 and, verse, and chapter 13. I show you a more excellent way. It's got to come from an excellent Christ. It'll make you immortal. It'll make you immortal. I've never said this, but I'll put it like I'd hate to be killable. I'd hate to live such a way that somebody could kill me. I'd hate to have such a cheap ministry that somebody could just snuff it out. I'd hate to have anything that shallow. I'd hate to be such a little old tree with such shallow roots that any little wind would blow it over or uproot it. What about you? Makes you immortal. He that doeth the will of God shall do what? Abide forever. Abide forever. That's living by faith. You can't live in the will of God except you live by faith. Oh, don't settle for less than what I'm talking about. Now then, I want to ask you a question. Where does faith come from? The Bible said God has measured. Think about that. Hey, do you have a measuring cup? I don't think my mother ever had a measuring cup. I don't know. I, she just take a pinch of this and a pinch of that and so forth. And, all right, well, I guess that's the way they used to do it. But a measuring cup, God took a measuring cup and he put the same amount in his measure. This is the only thing that I know of that he measured to every man alike, and that's faith. He gave every man the same amount of faith, the same kind of faith, and it's just a question of whether you're willing to use it or not. The Bible said he's measured to every man a measure of faith. God would never put you in the world without giving you some faith. He gives a little baby faith in a mother that he didn't even know. Why, of course, it won't be long till she'll capture its confidence, but that little baby, that little baby, you know, it never does as he grows up. Little children don't ever say, Mother, are, are you really sure that you're my mother? I mean, would you, would you go get my birth certificate for me, please? I mean, would you take me down to the courthouse? I want to know for sure that you're my mother. No, that little old boy, it never dawns on him, see? Even people that adopt a baby, well, they'll go for maybe a number of years, and finally uh, they'll, uh, you know, uh, come in and say, I believe it's time to tell him. I believe we ought to tell him. We ought to let him know, see? I mean, just because he'll find out someday, and we don't want him to distrust us. Would you let me tell the little story that's sweet and fine? You know, one of the sweetest things I got from the Earth Day, of course, besides the nearly $5,000 from the workers, that is great. That was about the most sanctified and about the sweetest money that I could ever get is nearly $5,000 came in from the workers just to say, Brother Olaf, we believe in it not only with our life, but with the money God has given to us. And so it's a real blessing, real wonderful blessing that 
the workers. And that's the only way it could be, really. I mean, after all, how could you stay in a work like this if you didn't believe in it with all your body, your soul, your mind, and your pocketbook? How could we ever really prove to the Lord that we're on the mission field if we withheld anything from him? But you remember some months ago, maybe a year or two ago, the little boy that um, came in from school and his shirt was tattered and his face was scratched and there was dried blood on his arms and, I mean, he'd been off to war. And the mother said, Johnny, what in the world? Said, now, mother, listen, I, you'd have done the same thing I did if somebody told you what they told me. And she said, son, what do you mean? Said, I, you can tell, said, I had a fight. And I mean, I had a good one, too. Well, said, son, you know I taught you not to fight. Yeah, but listen, when I tell you what I thought about it, you won't mind. Somebody said you wasn't my real mother and said my daddy wasn't my real daddy and said, I want you to know I let him have it. Said I fought him all over that school ground. Said I'm going to do it tomorrow too if he tells me the same thing. And the mother said, run, get washed up, son. Just go get washed up for supper. Mother's got some good things ready and daddy will be here in a minute. And about that time, the car drove up and the little old boy with all that blood and scratch and everything ran out and his daddy said, son, what in the world happened to my boy today? Did you fall out of a tree? No, he said, I fell on a boy and he and I fought. We fought. I fought him for all I was worth. And said, he tore my shirt and scratched my face and said, I, I fought him. And he had to tell the daddy what it's all about. He said, son, I loved him real good. He said, go to the bathroom now and get all cleaned up. And the, the husband and wife met in the kitchen, didn't they? And he said, I guess we're going to have to tell him, aren't we? He said, you tell him. No, she said, you're going to tell him. You're the daddy, and you're going to tell him after the meal is over. And uh, they didn't eat too much. That old boy sat at the table and said, I can't imagine anybody talking about my mom and my daddy the way he did, saying I didn't have a real mother, and I didn't have a real daddy. I guess I do have. Mm -hmm. And the little old fella still worked up about it. Supper was all over, and the daddy said, son, come sit in my lap. Just come sit in my lap. You're my big old boy. My, how I love you, son. And he said, son, Northern I have been waiting to tell you, but said, tell me what? Well, he said, uh, the boy was right about it. We're not your real mother. We're not your real daddy. That was a shock. But he said, son, I got good news for you. Don't you ever forget it. If the little boy wants to talk like that tomorrow, tell him what daddy told you tonight. You see, you needed a home, and uh, you were not ours by birth, but we loved you and we chose you. And said, tell the little boy that his mother and daddy just had to take what they got. And we took what we chose, and we looked at you and loved you, and we've loved you ever since. And we love you as much as that little boy's mother and dad could, because we chose you to be our very own. And we gave you our name, and we've given you our love and we'd be willing to die for you right now. And the little boy smiled and loved his daddy and said, that's enough. That's enough. You chose me. You wanted me, didn't you, daddy? And he said, I really did. And I still want you. Amen. Are you listening? The devil said to me one day, you know you were mine, don't you? And you know God's not your real father. And you know Jesus is not your real brother, don't you? I mean, they've just said all of that. You realize, don't you, that you've been adopted? Yeah. But dear friend, Jesus came and said, don't forget, I chose you. Before the foundation of the world. I mean, before anything ever happened, before God ever dug the Mississippi River, before he ever stuck up the majestic head of the Rocky Mountains, before he ever put up Pike's Peak, God said, I choose that little old ignorant, freckle-faced country boy as my own. I'm adopting it. And put him in my family. I'm going to love him forever. And you girls sit around and act like you don't love somebody like that. Oh, it ought to break our stubborn wills and melt our cold, stony hearts when we think about what God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. But I'm so glad he was willing to drink that old bitter cup. Although he prayed, Father, let it pass from me. 
and I'm so glad he didn't call heaven's angels from my hands pull these old nails that torment me oh had it not been for that's right and had it not been for the old rough good cross, had it not been for a man called Jesus, then forever my soul Bow your heads while we pray. Our Father, we know now that it's better to walk by faith than sight. In this path of yours and mine, in the pitch black night when there's no outer light, that's the time for faith to shine. When nothing whereon to lean remains and when strongholds crumble to dust, when nothing is sure but that God still reigns, that's just the time to trust. And we're trusting thee, Lord. We're trusting thee with our life. We're trusting thee with what you've given us. We thank thee, Father, for every open door and for another blessed week. And dear Lord, we pray for girls tonight to learn that sweet, wonderful, permanent, abiding lesson of faith, just living by faith. And Father, remind us that all the sins we've committed have stemmed from the big old ugly sin of unbelief. Thank you for joining us today on the Family Altar Program with Lester Roloff. You may listen to the preaching and the special music of the Family Altar Program 24 hours a day when you visit our ministry website, roloff.org. We love hearing from our listeners. If this broadcast has been a blessing to you, please write to us at Roloff Evangelistic Enterprises, P.O. Box 100, Fort Thomas, Arizona, 85536. Again, that's Roloff Evangelistic Enterprises, P.O. Box 100, Fort Thomas, Arizona, 85536. This broadcast is made possible by the prayers and financial support of listeners like you. Thank you for partnering with us, and remember that Christ is the answer.